Good evening, everyone in India. Good morning, everyone in California. And hello, everyone in between. Um, I'm very delighted to welcome you uh, to a book discussion uh, hosted by us at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. Um, we are going to be discussing uh, a new book by author and Professor Rohit Chopra, um, who is at Santa Clara University. Um, the book is called The Gita for a Global World, Ethical Action in an Age of Flux. And it has uh, just uh, a few weeks ago been published um, from uh, Context and Westland Books. Um, this is uh, not by any means uh, Rohit's uh, first book. Um, Rohit that was actually educated in Bombay and at Emory University, um, and he studied literature and liberal arts. Um, but now he teaches um, um, and, and, and does research on global media on cultural identity, um, new media, technologies and cultures, as well as what he calls post-colonial media. So he's been um, doing work on technology and nationalism, uh, on global media and identity. Um, and um, he uh, has uh, lately uh, decided through this book uh, to uh, focus on uh, ethical issues, but through a very, very uh, well-known uh, and uh, unexpected in this context uh, text, namely the Bhagavad Gita, um, which is uh, really um, um, uh, a text that needs no introduction, but um, in many senses, um, a text uh, uh, about war uh, and yet about so much more than war. Um, it's also about uh, really what, uh, what, what should guide our action uh, in any moment of crisis. Um, and uh, using that frame of, of, of crisis uh, escalated perhaps to the level of a war, um, uh, that's, that's uh, in a sense um, uh, uh, Rohit's entry point uh, for, for his uh, discussion on a wide range of topics in this book. Um, and um, I'm going to invite him now uh, to please uh, begin by telling us um, you know, uh, how it, it came to you to frame um, your discussion on crisis globalization, as you call it, um, in the context of the Bhagavad Gita. Well, thanks very much. Thanks to everyone who's here. And before I start, I want to thank CSDS for this kind and generous introduction. Uh, thanks to Ananya Devasya for making it here. Uh, uh, Praveen Ayodhya, a quick word of thanks also to Shweta and Ajita, uh, wonderful uh, folks I've worked with at Westland. Uh, so yes, yeah, as you know, I, I should say that uh, I uh, am delighted to be here, but I also have a little bit of trepidation because I am in a conversation with an Indologist and a philosopher and both of whom are much more, uh, uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, you know, experts. Uh, they have much greater expertise than me in the Bhagavad Gita and in the world of the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, but to respond to, to your question, Ananya, um, so the Gita is a book that, as I say, is, you know, starts on the edge of a crisis. Uh, it is a condition of crisis that faces Arjuna, which is specifically about, you know, whether he should go to war with his kinsmen or not. And then the dialogue between, you know, Arjuna and Krishna ensues. Uh, and one of the arguments I make in the book is that, uh, we live in a moment of what I call crisis globalization. Uh, you know, we are broadly in this historical phase you can call globalization or global capitalist modernity. Uh, but in many ways, in the last 20 years in particular, it seems that uh, in, in different realms, uh, uh, things have amped up. Uh, and many, many of the you know, certainties or, or the fixities of this globalized world have come into question. So there is uh, a great amount of political uncertainty. There's the rise of authoritarianism. We know this both at home and globally. 
Uh, there's increasing intolerance with difference of various kinds, religious, national, cultural, ethnic, uh, even as there is more assertion by groups who have been marked or as different or as stigmatized as minorities. Um, and, you know, there is the climate crisis that we, we face. And then in the last year and a half in particular, the COVID pandemic, <clears throat> sorry, has brought this uh, uh, this situation of a crisis to a fore. So I wanted to see if, you know, here was this text. By one account, there are, I think, you know, what was it? Perhaps something like 18,000 or, or or I'm getting a zero wrong, but thousands of translations, uh, thousands of commentaries on this text. It's been circulating globally for 200 years. So it's obviously had the quality of being able to speak to different times and places. And I wanted to see, uh, as someone who is an academic by vocation, but also a non-specialist in the Gita particularly, what could this text tell us about this particular moment? What guidance it could provide? But also, what were the places where it fell silent, such as, for instance, on questions of equality, and how we could rethink the Gita in terms of what the present compelled it to respond to? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Rohit. Um, I should mention, I can see uh, uh, a number of participants uh, who joined us on Zoom, and there are also people probably watching on Facebook Live. I just want to say that if you have a question uh, and you are with us on 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 Zoom, uh, please uh, type it into the Q and A box, which you can access from uh, the extreme um, uh, right uh, of your screen. Uh, that's where the questions should go, and and we'll we'll deal with them, um, you know, after 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 we've had our discussion. Um, so. Um, I, I, I wanted to, I, I, before I hand over to, to Devasya, uh, you know, to, 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 ask, to ask his first question, um, I just wanted to, since you mentioned climate change and you mentioned the pandemic and you mentioned, of course, you know, the, the, the kind of overall prevalent condition of capitalist modernity, of consumer capitalism, of, you know, uh, neoliberal economic, uh, crises that um, you know have have exacerbated social and political inequalities, uh, and have often gone hand in hand with war as well as with um, uh, you know uh, a greater sort of um, uh, ecological and environmental recklessness. Um, you know, um, I wanted to sort of introduce um, one of the themes that runs through your book, which is. Um, you know, uh, a frequent reference to Gandhi. Um, and uh, Gandhi, of course, as, as, as we know, was a great believer in the Gita. And he treated it as a guide for, for action, um, as, as a, you know, as an aid to reflection and meditation and spiritual self-purification. He read it for, you know, decades on end, literally every day. Um, and, um, you know, he also, um, I mean, he, he combined a kind of spiritual reading with, with, with uh, you know, his, his larger program for political action. Um, so one of the things that we also get from Gandhi, uh, especially in Hind Swaraj, uh, in, a, in a kind of uh, kernel form, um, is, is, is a critique, a prescient critique of uh, modern industrial society, modern technology, um, the technologies of war, and 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 um, you know, uh, uh, even even such basic uh, features of, of of industrial modernity as as the railways, right, or or, or modern medicine uh, and so on. Um, and at that time, this kind of uh, critique of modernization seemed. Uh, seemed completely anachronistic in the sense that it was, you know, it was out of sync with, with where the rest of the world was heading. But now that we've kind of reached the far end of that cycle, um, and we are almost on the point of a global climate catastrophe, as well as, you know, um, uh, you know pretty severe resource um, uh, kind of collapse uh, in terms of natural resources and so on. Um, 
what uh, you know uh, how how do you how do you make the connections in your head between gandhi's reading of the gita and gandhi's critique of technology which emerges from other writings uh, of his not necessarily on the gita but definitely in hind swaraj um and how do you feel that this um you know how how is it that gandhi is able to foresee something which the whole of the rest of the world is not able to foresee um you know uh, a century ago it's a wonderful question and it's a question that actually is one that i come back to i'll let me just start by sharing an anecdote about you know i first encountered the the uh, the, the text hind swaraj when i was working on my dissertation and i have a much longer reflection on it on the book that came out of the dissertation um uh, but i i now see it in a somewhat different light because you know one can keep keep going back to gandhi and find new things so when i was at emory i after i did my phd i taught for a year as a visiting assistant professor there i took taught a course called from gandhi to google on technology and nationalism in india and i had a lot of second generation indian students indian americans and <clears throat> these are students who've been brought up to revere gandhi many of them would just they would not even say gandhi they would say gandhi ji because that's how their parents had you know uh, uh sort of that's what their parents had taught them to say and they also wanted to be doctors and engineers and so on so when they read hind swaraj they were very deeply almost personally hurt that why is gandhi he's rejecting western science and medicine he's rejecting the railways he's rejecting the benefits of you know advanced industrial uh, in industri industrialization which are good things they will help us fight disease they will help india develop and so on so hind swaraj is a text that i think you know there gandhi is being very very strategic in his critique uh and i think what he's basically doing is he's sort of amplifying what he sees as the negative possibilities contained in a kind of instrumentalist and deterministic thinking of technology now how do you link the gita here uh so <clears throat> i think for me the connection is and first i should mention that there there is actually some interesting scholarly work on how the gita itself informs gandhi's reading in hind swaraj uh and there's a particular kind of uh, uh, sequence of events a genealogy that that a couple of scholars have mapped but I, i don't want to get into those sort of deep academic debates here for me what linked both of these texts together was really the concept of nishkama karma yog which is the idea of action without a desire to control outcomes uh and in a sense this is what animates in in my reading gandhi's critique of technology so there's a very interesting point where he actually says that with the railways you know earlier people who were spiritual and they wanted to get the benefits of that spirituality they would actually undertake pilgrimages on foot but now rogues and his exact word in the translation is rogues rogues can hop onto a train and they can go to a shrine and they can get this you know this spiritual reward and what gandhi says essentially there is that there is a kind of instrumentality here in in the fact that technology represents a will to control outcomes and that links that to me is the connection with the gita because uh the the point is that you know in chapter 2 verse 47 that you have a right to fulfill your obligations or you should fulfill your obligations but you do not have an entitlement to the fruit of your outcomes that does not mean however that you do not engage in inaction so for me the genius of gandhi's work based on this principle is that you know we have to live with a certain epistemic humility but also a certain ecological humility that we cannot shape the world whether you know through these kinds of through these kinds of instruments and it's very interesting what you mentioned about gandhi being you know way ahead of the curve absolutely because i think by the 30s and 40s you have the frankfurt school hockheimer and adorno and others really talking about the domination of nature and talking about an instrumentalist understanding of technology which has led to a kind of devastation of the world uh, and then i also find an interesting resonance there with heidegger's he's got a marvelous essay called the question concerning technology where heidegger says that what technology does is it frames the world in a certain way so when you see a river you think of a river as a river but once you think with a technological mindset the river becomes a source of energy that can be dammed um 
and captured. And I think Gandhi kind of anticipates this and he understands that this orientation towards nature will be enormously destructive. And, you know, here we are a hundred uh, odd years later since Gandhi wrote Hind Swaraj and he's absolutely spot on. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, <clears throat> we've had an ongoing discussion about development and violence uh, at the center uh, around uh, a lot of the work that Professor Nandi's uh, done, you know, over the, over the decades. Um, but I think this is probably um, a good time to mention two things. One that, uh, you know, Nishkama Karma as a, as, a, as a phrase actually we discovered through our conversations with you uh, doesn't uh, in fact occur per se in in the text of the Gita, um, you know, but it, it nevertheless summarizes um, a certain uh, attitude towards action and a certain orientation towards the consequences of action, um, which which of course you you know you try you you try to develop uh, in opposition to uh, the materialist, instrumentalist, and 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 highly uh, kind of um, uh, you know exploitative way in which uh, in which uh, neoliberal uh, capitalism proceeds. Um, so this is actually an excellent point, I think, to uh, introduce um, uh, uh, our uh, guest and our discussant, uh, who is also, uh, I think, by now uh, a dear friend to, to me, uh, somebody very familiar, um, uh, Dr. Devasya Anthony. He um, uh, teaches uh, philosophy at uh, Hindu College. He's been at Delhi University for a long time. And he uh, is a very frequent visitor, speaker, participant in our uh, various discussions at CSDS, especially when actually we're looking at um, uh, philosophical texts, but also specifically philosophical texts from various in Indian traditions um, and various kinds of, um, uh, you know, religious religio philosophical texts uh, where his knowledge is uh, really uh, quite, uh, uh, quite wide ranging. So, um, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's joined us and I think that that will absolutely deepen our discussion in, in, in many interesting ways and connect with your own interests, uh, Rohit. So, um, uh, Devasya, why don't you come in uh, and, 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 and let's, let's hear what you have to say. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, am I audible? Uh, you could speak a little louder, maybe. Okay, 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 okay. Right. So, uh, first and foremost, I should thank Anani and Rohit for having invited me uh, to be part of this discussion, this samba, as we call it. It's, 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 it's really a pleasure to be part of it. And, I, and as Anani has said, I go to see this often. And not only because of its geographical proximity to University of Delhi, but I find lot of enriching uh, discussions there. I can take something back home whenever I've gone there. So thank you so much for the invitation, Ananya and, uh, and uh, Rohit. Rohit, thank you for writing this book. I would term this as Rohit Vishada Yoga. Yeah. Why? Because, uh, in fact, I marked with all these text liners, you know, as I was going through this book, I can see your excruciating pain and agony over what happens in the world today. Then you also have the inside look at the Gita as a text because you see some light there. And therefore I find, as I think I already wrote to you in my comments, and I reminded me, which I forgot already, that I see there is transparency in your life in writing. And that makes this text, this book, endearing to people. So thank you for writing. I don't think I have understood this book completely. I read again. I, I had to allow the book to, uh, to, to, to speak to me. I, I should give that space for that. Second thing, normally Gita is uh, discussed in two, three ways. First is the Shastra Bhadadi by Sanskrit Acharyas. First, they would ask you, do you know Sanskrit? If you don't know, you are no Adhigara. Keep, keep the book closed. The second is Indologists. 
you know, they would give us the conceptual history of a term, like Nishkama Karma or Yoga, etc. You know, exactly what exactly it means, you know. And Shetra, uh, Shetra, if, if you recite the first sloka, yeah, a beautiful Tanakshetra, Kurikshetra, so Shetra, Shetra, what of these things are? I, I remember uh, my teacher, and he also knows, but, but Ramchandra Gandhi, he could go on into this, uh, into this, you know. Um, so what I'm telling you is that's one way of doing it, you know, to tease out the ideas from that. But I believe these texts will speak to most of my students in the University of Delhi. Because they are not so much worried about his uh, Sanskrit origin of the words. They, they are living in a different kind of a life. Because I, I love the way when you discuss what is the, what is the need of good life today? You know, I mean, paisa kamana hai, ish insan, bangla banana hai, bari gadi kharidna hai, sab chiz. In fact, most of my students have this American dream, you know, okay. And maybe 90% of them will prepare for, uh, for civil services. So they will understand this. But of course, you, you, it's actually a kind of, you know, paradox. You, you, at the end, the end with the Gita, the global and the Gandhi, and it, and it takes us to understand this issue. So therefore, it, it, it's, it's a text for the contemporary youth, I should say, yeah, who are not Sanskritists, who, who, who are looking for, as according to Kant, you know, how should, how, how, how I want to live my life? You know, he asks actually four important questions in his lectures on logic. What can I know? What I hope to do? What can I hope for? Last one is, uh, what is man? Now, therefore, this book is unputdownable. I should say that to some extent. And my young uh, students will, uh, adults will really love it. I mean, I, I think I'm sure about this. Fine. Second, since you have, and I love, especially your discussion, this karma karma, you have this, uh, you know, this in Sanskrit, there's a saying, you know, uh, Shika Chandra Nyaya. Suppose a young child wants to know where is the moon. The mother will take the child, you know, on her lap and first show the child the, the branch of a tree. Then you will uh, ask the child, look at about that. You know, that is the moon. Your book does that. You know, it is it, it, it's a kind of, it points to, at the same time, you are not afraid of, you know, taking into heart its uncertainty. It's what you call hermeneutic ambiguity. And in that you privilege Gandhi's reading of the Gita. I think that is the location. I think you are, uh, you are preparing a fertile ground, you know, the fertile ground of hermeneutic reading, uh, you know, to, to, to appropriate what Gandhi then do. There, I think I have already, so therefore it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's a wonderful work. And I think today's uh, young people will appreciate this. Of course, they are used to, you know, maybe like the, the, the two to hundred words, you know, not a book like this, but I'm sure the patient to read this, I'm sure they will, uh, they will enjoy the end of the end of the day. Now, that is also my problem. Why? You begin to, you, you privilege Gandhi's reading of the Gita. Uh, for the right reasons, and I'm I'm on with that hundred percent. I'm with you. But your philosophical locution of that is problematic. Uh, you say, I don't want to read it like a religious person from the shastra point of view, or a person you know who has who takes to divinity. Okay, because you say, I think I've heard you. <laughs> because you say, and that is much more. It's like a, for me, like a you know atom bomb. It forecloses the possibility of interpretation. If that were the case, Rohit Gandhi won't be there at all. He could be Savarka. He, 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 he could be somebody else. That's the reason why God say want to shoot him. I don't think Gandhi tried to say himself. He said Ram. What is that? I don't think so. My question is, and for this, I I I owe my debt to. I think and I also know a Professor uh, Ramchandra Gandhi. So this is what I like to say. And in fact, in 19, 1924, in Young India, he writes the first uh, philosophical technique, Tandra. What does Gandhi do here? Gandhi says, 
Mahabharata to me is not a historical record. Poor history. Right. Okay. It is hopeless as a history is such that. 1924, he writes in Young India, right? It's a poetry. So it is poetically true, not historically true. That truth is, that truth is hermeneutically significant for your self-realization. He says it's a somewhat between uh, the good and evil. That reminds me of the Christian Manichaean heresy, etc. Evil, Satan is a profound good man. Therefore, he is, you know, he he individualizes, you know, the whole text. It is not out in Kurukshetra there. Kurukshetra is here, within you, within me and you. Now, that is my problem. Second, in 1925, he writes, no Dick and Harry can rule this Shastra reading. He, is, he, is, he speaks about Adhikara Veda. Who is eligible? Now, this is a core of Indian tradition. You want to read a Shastra, you should have Adhikara Veda. Adhikara Veda. It's not the caste system, please. I don't believe. I, but I'm telling you this. One should be spiritually able to understand. He says, the condition is, he says, only those who have experienced in the practice of the truth enshrined in the text has the capacity to understand it. This is in Navajivan, 1925, 11th October. Now, with this, I thought you were trying to place the so-called secular rationality in one way, you know, on the other, on the other, you also have that, you know, longing for this Gandhi, this Gandhi, because I'm, because you, you are privileging Gandhi reading the Gita, that's it, Anasakta Yoga, he says that, and therefore he says you can interpret the way, he says the Shastras go against the truth, don't obey it, just discard that. So my point is this, why do you have such kind of, uh, you know, uh, locutionary, you know, to use uh, the Austin's theory, speech act theory, locutionary problematic. For Gandhi, it was a speech act theory. Speech act theory. You know, speech act. The truth for it doesn't matter. It is relevant for him. So I like to see this. And in fact, um, you know, I don't want to go into that. So my question, and, and of course, in support of your thesis, you are very good at it. You caught early Wittgenstein, author of Tractatus, but you stopped with him. What about later Wittgenstein, the author of philosophical investigations? What about the author of the philosophical grammar or not books? In fact, he speaks about depth grammar of words, in fact. So my question is this, this is what, you know, I was, as I was reading, I mean, I agree. That it, it is, it is provocative, but you, you, you ask me this. So I would like to uh, get your comments on this philosophical location of this problematic in privileging the gun, uh, the gun reading the Gita, but you are hesitant to somehow to, 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 to see Gandhi in a way as I am. I could be wrong. And I don't claim in financial to my view, but you, you, you seem to somehow, you know, have certain thoughts on that. That's it. Thank you, Raju. Well, thank you very much, Devasya, first of all, for willing to participate. I'm, I'm really honored. And thank you for that incredibly, uh, your incredibly generous words about the book. Uh, and, you know, sometimes one is so close to a book that one doesn't have much perspective on aspects of it. But it's come back to me and it's been framed for me by you in, in very interesting ways. And you're absolutely right. As you send these questions, I really started thinking about them in a... Uh, you know, in, 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 in more in more detail. And, and I think that the book represents, I think, some some tensions, which I think are really fundamental to, uh, I mean, it's a deeply personal book for me also really fundamental to my own thinking about, I would say religion. And I think there's two or three words, keywords that I'll introduce out here. And I think the distinction is something that I really should have made much clearer. Uh, one is again, you know, we come back to this really complicated question of sort of what religion means. Uh, how do we understand religion in terms of in relation to in other words, which is the spiritual? Uh, what role do we see for religion? And I, on the one hand, I, you know, my thinking is deeply influenced by a teacher of mine, Professor Abdullahi Annaim, 
who uh, you know has written a book towards an Islamic reformation and has undertaken a similar kind of hermeneutic and political exercise with regard to the Quran and hadiths and Sharia, uh, which is the you know and 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 what he essentially talks about is and at the same time he's offered a kind of critique of the idea of the Islamic state and. <clears throat> One of the distinctions he makes is in his understanding of secularism, and that's his 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 most one of his more recent books, and one that I, I you know had the privilege of working with him as a research assistant on at Emory, which is that by itself, you know, secularism is 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 basically uh, you could think of it as a holding process in Akil Bilgrami's phrase, or as, as as a kind of shell. It's and secularism the we cannot think of it as a separation of religion and politics uh, because religion and politics cannot effectively be separated whether it's in the us people will act based on what their pastors tell him or people will act out of you know some kind of spiritual motivation he makes a conceptual distinction between religion and the state that you should not have religion as an official kind of reason of state because then challenging it becomes a kind of sort of heresy right at the same time to give secularism to get its actual spiritual content in other words to get lived legitimacy in the ground of people's lives needs to draw on on that kind of religion and then you know we also have talal asad's uh, essential beautiful anthropology of secularism where he shows how in the western context secularism is both shaped but also encumbered by its kind of you know christian roots so for me on the one hand i did want to look at gandhi's gesture towards or not even gesture or gesture towards gandhi's sort of working through the you know some notion of the spiritual i do say in a couple of places that it's not entirely possible to escape the you know whether you want to call it the divine or the transcendent and I think one of the ways my hesitation worked itself through is that I've been thinking about the history of, you know, the Gita in India and the history of Hinduism and Hindu authority in India. So when I was using that, and I was imprecise there, I should have had at least a few more pages. You're absolutely right. I think I was talking more in terms of the fact that you have now these structures of religious authority, right, as they exist in, in practice, right, which essentially say that only these groups can speak about the Gita, only these interpretations are allowed. But I think you're absolutely right that the tradition itself allows in a way for radically challenging those. And, and that I completely agree is, uh, you know, is an area which, which I should have kind of excavated more. That's an unresolved tension. Now coming to the question of Wittgenstein, the later Wittgenstein, I mean, one of the ways I try to think about the book is as a kind of working through. And, uh, you know, whether, uh, and we could come to this a little later in the conversation with regard to the question of equality, for instance, and difference that, you know, w one kind of reading, which often makes me uneasy is when people say that, well, yeah, this is there in XYZ text, and it's not a very nice sentiment, but we can subsume it into a kind of larger narrative. Uh, for me, I think part of, you know, the method of reading is to actually keep those contradictions and say that, we can't get over those contradictions and we need to kind of foreground those contradictions. And by the end of the reading, if whatever sort of understanding one takes away through my engagement or whatever point I've come to, I think of it in terms of, you know, Wittgenstein, what Wittgenstein says about how we should think of philosophy, right? Not as this finished complete project for answers, but let's think of it as really a, in a very practical sense as, you know, whatever tools we need, to help us think through something, which is why my favorite anecdote about one of my favorite anecdotes about Wittgenstein from his Remonk's lovely biography is he told it's really beautiful. Like he told two of his students, they said we want to be philosophers, and he said, give up philosophy and take up gardening. And apparently those students were they were really pissed because they were pissed off later in life because I think they might have had really good careers as philosophers. But I see his point. It's like getting to that point of cultivation and what happens on the way is just a step. So I don't know if that I think that's a, in some ways a, a, a sort of inadequate response to your questions, which are very profound. But I absolutely agree that that's a really good, good point of critique, you know, and I'm sure you are familiar with this and Ananya is familiar with this. And I'll just stop in a second that when you finish a book, then you suddenly realize these are all the other questions I wanted to answer the whole. There's a whole other set of questions that open up. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rohit. In fact, that's the beauty of your book. It provokes. It provokes. And I believe, I, I also tell you know, my students, you know, philosophy is the art of the asking of a question, not very much its answerability. 
because answer becomes a question in the next one. Thank you so much. Um, actually, I think this is a good point uh, at which to um, run with this problem of secular versus spiritual um, understandings, readings, interpretations, and hermeneutic frameworks for a text like the Gita. Now, I mean, all of us know that the Gita works for different people, you know, from different perspectives. I mean, it, you know, you, you have uh, Oppenheimer uh, remembering it and you have, uh, you know, Gandhi remembering it and you have, you know, Ambedkar criticizing it and you have, you know, it, it just, it, it, it has this kind of, um, uh, you know, it opens out the question of Adhikara, right? Uh, in a sense, uh, I mean, if you if you if you go by very stringent uh, shastric definitions of what is adhikara, I mean, adhikara means um, you know uh, uh, the domain really uh, to which um, uh, particular groups have access, right? Uh, and uh, it also means something like command, right? Uh, although in in modern Indian languages we 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 take it to be a translation of the word right. Uh, but it, it, you know, in, 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 in the, in the kind of uh, Sanskrit tradition, it, it, it has a whole range of meanings, including your command, your mastery, you know, your capacity to, to, uh, you know, dominate a text, right. Um, and to, to, to make it speak as it were. Um, and, and the, the Gita interestingly, um, you know, lets people in, right. Uh, because at, at some level, it's, it's, it's a conversation, uh, you know, between these two characters, Krishna and Arjuna, who are also like a teacher and a pupil, or friends, you know, or brothers in arms, or, you know, the driver of the chariot and, and the, the prince in the chariot and so on. I mean, there's such a multiplicity of relationships that define this samvad, right, this speaking together. But it's 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 also kind of internal dialogue that many of us have with our conscience, with our fear, with our you know uh, doubts, with our uh, loyalties, uh, with our with our commitments, uh, you know, and 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 with our blind spots, right? Now, those can be figured uh, as being conversations with a divine figure you know, God himself, like Krishna is in some versions. Um, but it can also be a kind of interior conversation. Um, and, and I think for Gandhi, it, it very much was that. But this doesn't still solve the problem of, for example, Ambedkar's critique of the Gita, right? Now, for Ambedkar, it is not the spiritual or the philosophical or the metaphysical or the religious aspects of this text, which are uh, meaningful, interesting, attractive, because for him, um, the text occurs within a social framing. It's embedded in a context and that context is both political as well as social. And that context admits of power, of hierarchy, of inequality, of caste, of violence, right? Um, and a whole plethora of, you know, um, values, um, you know, which, which, which uh, Gandhi sort of solved, bracketed this problem by saying the Mahabharata is not historical at all. So let's forget about history. But for Ambedkar, everything is, you know, historically in some sense, true or indicative or, you know, this, this kind of text is indicative of some earlier stage of Indian history, um, you know, and, and he thinks of it in terms of being a, a counter reformation, you know, a, 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 a counter reformation, a reactionary text to the kind of revolution that the Buddha had initiated uh, in, in, in Vedic Dharma. And um, this is, you know, this goes to the heart of the question. Um, of, of, of the spiritual and the secular, right? Because in a sense, 
you know, the secular uh, and the social are directly and inextricably connected in, in Indian modernity, right? I mean, we have tried to define the social in terms of the secular, right? And now we are seeing this kind of eruption of religion um, in, into, the, into the social sphere and into the political sphere, which is absolutely not, we are not able to kind of control that, right? And so here a text like the Gita becomes very uh, bivalent, you know, very, very ambiguous and quite dangerous in a sense. Right, it's like it's like holding a grenade in your hand, you know. I mean, it could it could give you sort of moksha, but it could also sort of you know blow up your your uh, egalitarian um, you know and secular ideals uh, as a as a as a modern post colonial democratic society. Um, so, how do you negotiate that? Uh, I mean, what kind of you know ideas do you mobilize to? to make <clears throat> Gita something that ultimately you can work with and that you're not going to reject out of hand um, because of its um, religious or its historical, you know, um, uh, implications, possible implications. It's a wonderful question. And, and I think it's, it's a burning and urgent question. And this is a question that I think applies specifically to the Gita, but the Gita here can be symbolic of really the whole question of Hinduism and the broader question in Indian society of who has the authority to speak about what kinds of issues. Uh, and one of the questions that I grappled with quite deeply is, you know, uh, here in San Francisco, you know that sort of Berkeley has got its history, but not very far from San Francisco. It's 20 minutes away from where I live. History of the hippie movement, you'll find any number of, you know, copies of the Bhagavad Gita. You find, um, uh, you know, you find among diasporic, non-resident Indian populations, uh, you know, there are discourses on the Gita, there are events held to do with the Gita. Uh, and, you know, at the same time, I, I don't want to sort of make a sweeping generalization, but these same NRI populations, especially here in the Bay Area, are also very, very strong supporters of uh, the Hindu Nationalist Project, and in fact, have funded it for years. They are a very, very key bastion of support. So one of the questions that arose for me is that, is, is the Gita, at least the way the Gita is read, or, you know, given it's the legacies of how it's been read, is it a way for privileged caste Hindus to have their casteist cake and eat it too? In other words, you know, it endorses their vision of hierarchy, even if they don't explicitly say so, uh, <clears throat> their vision of, you know, the authority that privileged caste Hindus have in Indian society or global Indian communities, while also allowing them to espouse or pretend to espouse some kind of, you know, vapid universalism, right? The whole world is one family, everything is wonderful, and, you know, we are all equal. So the, the way to respond is, uh, you know, I think we need to take Ambedkar's critique very, very seriously. I say in the book at the beginning of the, at the end of the first chapter, that my reading is, com I'm completely aware that it, it reflects my own individual history, but also my, you know, social location and my privileged position. This is a text that could be seen as hegemonic. This is a text that could be seen as something that's shut, that shuts down conversation. This is a text that could be seen as, you know, not as sort of functioning in a way that tells people you cannot comment about it. Uh, now, it's very interesting that, you know, the metaphor of the, when you think of battlefield, right, Kurukshetra, one of the ways to think about this is that, can we use the text itself to level that social battlefield, right? In other words, that can we, can we make the text democratically accessible to all and allow for those readings? In fact, we open up the question of Adhikara, and I'm really glad you brought up that question of the uh, nuances and, and resonances of words in Sanskrit, because that was something that gave me a lot of tension, right? Because here are these incredibly complex words with these resonances, even in Hindi, for instance, Dharma, Karma have resonances, which you can't find in English. So I was very cautious about that. So I looked, you know, to at some sort of histories of how the text has traveled. And, uh, you know, it's it's been at some points of time, a revolutionary force, like, for instance, uh, you know, I think Tilak saw it as a kind of uh, uh, source for anti-colonial action. The British considered it, uh, you know, seditious. If you were found with, I think, two copies of the Gita in, in uh, uh, the 20th century, you could actually be arrested on grounds of sedition. But for Ambedkar, as you pointed out, he actually said, the, he also said that the Gita is 
its status in sort of Hinduism, caste Hinduism is its equivalent to a Bible, right? Although we don't exactly have those kind of parallels. So that's one kind of uh, fact. But on the other hand, there is the kind of history that both Devasya alluded to, and I think Laurie Patton in her introduction to the Gita says that it's a text that is in some ways not a high Hindu text, right? You also find it, uh, you know, women uh, drawing upon the Gita, or you've, you, you know, you might find different kinds of communities all over India, and this, the, the, the it's, it's the sense in which they, they invoke the Gita or they see it as a part of their lives is not contingent upon their hierarchy. Uh, upon their you know place in the social hierarchy. Now the difficult question, of course, is how do you do that? Because every time you have any kind of really comment or someone you know whether it's a Western scholar, whether it's an Indian scholar, especially la the last thirty years in India, you have all these Hindu right groups sort of descending on them. Uh, so in practical terms, doing that is 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 a difficult issue, and I don't know that we have the answer. But I think in a very small way, accepting all the privilege that I have and the comfort I have and the fact that I can give gyan from the US, all of that, mm -hmm. I've just tried to take a small step towards saying that we have to democratize reading. And I understand in, again, a very small way and not to claim that in any which way I can, I can understand, you know, what it means to, let's say, be a member of a religious minority who wants to say, this is a hegemonic text. I, I will not say that. But as some, you know, there's trepidation in writing this, thinking that there are these Indologists and Sanskritists and philosophers, right, who are authorities, and they might rip me to shreds, right? That's that's one thing, because academia has its own hierarchies and rituals, you know, we, we know that and it's cliques. Uh, and then when you just think, when you get into the social battlefield, that here is a text marked as the, that has become marked as the property of one community and some groups within that, uh, you know, how difficult it must be to, to essentially make that kind of reading. But I think we have to, we have to democratize the space of interpretation and we have to, you know, allow for those kinds of, you know, radical readings and we have to allow for readings that, uh, that essentially, uh, uh, you know, critique it on all these grounds and even critique the figure of religious authority. Uh, I had someone ask me a wonderful question. He said that, you know, Krishna says to Arjuna that you try A, B, C, D, E, and then he goes on to say that if all else fails, if everything fails, you put your faith in me. And he says, how do I tell my daughter this? Uh, and I said, you have to say that that is, not that is not compatible with the modern world. Now, the question here is, can we just set all these aspects aside? No, I don't think we can. I've tried in some limited way to say we read the Gita against the Gita, but I think that tension stays permanent. We have to accept that it is a text that is consistent with the hierarchies and inequalities of caste. It is a text that is consistent with, with a patriarchal order. And what we must do is just as we can use the Gita to illuminate some aspects of the present, we can use our present day understanding of equality and political commitment to really read the text in that light. So we rehistoricize it. And I think that historical framing that Ambedkar pointed to is, is absolutely essential to any, any reading. So I, I think I've probably not answered the question more than raise uh, uh, more questions, but I'd be interested in both what you, Ananya, and you, Devasya, have to also say about how we go about doing this. Actually, I want Devasya to, to speak about this because, you know, he is more of a Sanskritist, more of an Indologist, and more of a philosopher than I am. Uh, but also, you know, I mean, uh, he, he's, he's very uh, conversant with, you know, uh, uh, certain traditions of interpretation. Um, which can be construed as philosophical, but can also be construed as religious because of the way in which we, we you know, we don't necessarily always right. separate out these terms within the interpretive tradition um, that accrues around texts like the Gita. So, I mean, you've done this for a long time, Devasya, and, and your guru before you, I mean, Ram Gandhi before you. So tell, tell, tell us, I mean, um, you know, how do you personally deal with with this question of the secular uh, versus the the religious when it comes to a text like the Gita, and and what is you know what is finding a book like Rohit's like how does that kind of uh, you know set you off on a different track or not? Yeah. 
Thank you for this difficult question, Ananya. And I think it's very difficult. And it's this not is my question. It's posed. It's it's yeah, yeah. It's elicited, a, you know, the book elicits a question like that. The, also, also the book of Rohit. I mean, it's an interesting <laughs> question. I should say that. And I thought um, I used to ask myself, why it is that now? Just maybe to to you know switching on to the other one, the book by you, the Righteous Republic. Uh, the prism, the lens you use for Gandhi is Ahimsa. For Ambedkar, it is Dukkha. If I, if I, if a number is right, I read that. You know, not all pages, but they know. So my question would be this, and I found uh, inspiration in the writings of D. Nagaraj. Now, uh, Ekon Rashid Nandi was one of the most promising, you know, intellectuals of contemporary India, but he died very young. I, I happened to read some of his writings. He was business called at Harvard, I believe, and he left just Chicago, Chicago. And there he says, the problem is this, Ambedkar thought that he could solve the problem of this caste untouchability of this problem in India through the prism of the enlightenment canon. Gandhi thought, no, it is in our tradition. It's a question of purifying it, asking the right questions. It starts with you. Now, uh, therefore, Ambedkar thought Hinduism cannot be reformed. Let me get out of it. You know, he became a Buddhist with Mahar untouchables. And in, in fact, his experience is fantastic. So I think we have these two registers operating here. So it is not Ambedkar versus Gandhi or either Ambedkar or Gandhi. I should say Ambedkar and, and Gandhi. This and is a connective. It's an it's an, a kind of a space that gives me to but go read them. I also have a hinge, you know. In fact, the, the, the appearance of Ambedkar on getting the Buddhist Diksha at Nagpur to resembles almost the Gandhi in his clothes. And uh, before the Ambedkar, what he was, was like Gandhi at South Africa or in London during his studies. So my question is here, we have two people who have for honest seekers, I should, I should, I should, I should, I will, I will, I will speak of them as honest truth seekers. Truth seekers, no doubt about it. So I found this writing by Bodhik uh, Nagaraj. I think it's very, very helpful and, uh, you know, very, very interesting. I don't know, has any Dalit intellectual written a commentary on the Gita? I have not come across so far. I, I, Anya might know, I don't know, I have not come across so far. I agreed. I agree because even people like Dajendra Prasad, who was teaching at IIT Kanpur, he says this text is only reinforcing the Varnasrama Dharma. Because at one point, Krishna tells Arjuna, You are a Kshatriya, so perform your Sodharma. Okay? He spares nobody. So, my, that is one reading of the Gita. But the point is this. If you look at the end of Arjuna Vishada Yoga, how come this uh, Arjuna, who was so much you know, depressed, becomes all of a sudden source of energy? Because he sees the Virata Rupa of Krishna. Now, I think this experience is available both to Ambedkar and, and to Gandhi. Otherwise, I still believe Ambedkar would not have taken to Buddhism. I still, though, though they say the Buddha is Dhamma, the work is different, it is nothing of Buddhist principles, it is a question of, otherwise he would have said, they can still continue with the, uh, the principles of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, justice, that's enough. So, and I don't know why, so these are my points which I saw, so I, 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 I have this problem, uh, you know, in seeing this, that it is, uh, Secular in Ambedkar and religious Gandhi. I don't think so. I think Gandhi shows us the sacrality of the secular, and Ambedkar invites us to 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 carry us further the notion of this secular sacred divide when he took to a Buddhism. Now I mean spiritual uh, practices, which gives you a kind of non-fragmented vision of life. 
And this is possible. I think I think both of them. Uh, both of them. I was touched. I was touched when I saw Gandhi's movie, the movie Bat and Bob. You know, there, there is one meeting where Gandhi is, uh, you know, there he's sick. He's also not well, and Ambedkar comes in and he calls his son Devadas Gandhi. Okay, and tells the Devadas, please see that Ambedkar gets a place to stay tonight because of caste, you know, untouchability. Nobody will give a a, a place to stay for an untouchable. How can this compassion, not uh, some kind of, you know, patronizing pity? No, 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 no. It is that. I think that is what Gandhi is telling. I am not only for the Brahmins or Banyas. No, no, no. If you are self, that self has to be non-fragmented. 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 So this is, I think this is, this is so, in fact, uh, Ashish Nandi once he says that Gandhi's philosophical or religious approach is more like Tamanuja Vishishta. There is difference. But, but the difference is not oppressive, not exploitative. It is celebrated. The problem is, is in our country, if you are born and untouchable, you are untouchable forever. That is the problem. So this is, I think, this is what we have to, uh, you know, uh, remove from uh, from its root. That is not, I don't, I agree, uh, either is ambiguous text. There are people who say that only reinforces the, the Varnasrama Dharma. Therefore, you can't have a religious reading of that. It has to be, it has to be what you call, you know, uh, taken out of our uh, Indian tradition. And that is why I like uh, Gandhi saying, it's not saying you should be qualified in the you should be able to have the practice of these principles. Of a principle. Therefore, you are right, Ananya, when you termed Ahinsa as the lens through which to read Gandhi. And you, you termed Dukkha as the lens uh, to read uh, Ambedkar, Ambedkar. So I do not go by the caption, the doctor and the saint. No. The saint is also a doctor. He is a doctor of the soul, Foucault. Ah, doctor of the soul. You are also a saint. Saint of those who uh, need healing. Healing. I think D. Nagaraj, I, I, I think my friend is Shankar Ramaswamy will, will be able to maybe read more on this. But I think he gives us an opening to that. This is, this is my uh, sporadic reflections. I have not deeply thought about it. But this is the way I uh, try to look at that. In fact, uh, uh, Ramu Gandhi would say, the problem with Ambedkar was that he never went to Tidivanam Malai. That's a kind of a metaphorical way of, you know, and then, yeah, you've heard it many times. It's a way of putting it that, you know? Yeah. But look at the courage of Gandhi to go and live with these poor people. The courage of this person. That can only come from your conscience, from your inner Atma Shakti. Okay. Actually... Uh yeah, they were saying, let me, let me ask Rohit on this very point. Um, you know, you have a critique of, uh, for example, the tech moguls, um, right? And the Silicon Valley billionaires and the, the you know, founders and, 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 and proponents of, of, of Facebook and, and, and Twitter and whatever, you know, Jeff Bezos and, and Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, the whole kind of social media, uh, you know, the, the, the whole, the, the, the phenomenon and, and, and then as well as the, the personalities, right? And the kind of economic ideology driving um, these kind of people. Now, uh, I think you, you know, you set up a very interesting um, uh, opposition between uh, what, what drives somebody like uh, a Zuckerberg or, a, or, or a Jeff Bezos and, uh, you know, what, what, what Gandhi is trying to uh, tell us about Nishkama Karma, right? That I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like a head-on collision between two different uh, understandings of the drivers of human action and the, you know, motivations for human agency uh, and, and, and a, a kind of, uh, you know, ethic of being in the world. Um, so, you know, from your perspective, why don't you tell us, and you're sitting in California, uh, you know, and you began your life with rediff.com. So, so tell us, uh, you know, um, what 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 is it about social media 
and our moment uh, you know in in this kind of world saturated by the the, the internet uh, that um, you know that that somehow led you back uh, almost like you know somebody groping for light in in a dark tunnel uh, to the geeta via gandhi um, and and unmute please i remember reading someone that this the phrase of 2020 and 2021 is you're on mute <laughs> with the amount of time we spend on zoom thank you it's a wonderful question so yeah so i you know i i in early in my career i worked for readif.com when it was a kind of a startup for two years but as i always tell people i was not smart enough to negotiate stock options uh but you know maybe that that's a blessing in in another way uh, and you know, even early in the early years of the internet, uh, the post-web internet, because the internet's been around since the '60s, there was this sort of euphoria, this completely kind of this techno utopianism, right? Here is this new technology that's going to do da da da, and Google, when Google arrived on the scene, their sort of notion was, you know, don't do evil. Facebook's mantra is we want to build community, all sort of very wonderful sounding even Gandhian sentiments, right? Don't do evil, first do no harm, right? One of, Gandhi, you could say that in that sense, Google is basically uh, one of Gandhiji's three monkeys, right? Or the fourth monkey or whatever. But even then, you know, there was in academia, there was a critique of both cyber utopian, but also cyber dystopian perspectives. Now to me, what's incredible is kind of the arrogance of these, these companies and the people who, who kind of head them, right? And that's a twofold arrogance. One, it's an arrogance about we will reshape the world in a particular manner. And secondly, they're completely convinced that even as they go out harvesting our data, even as they, you know, for which none of us ever gave them permission, even as they, they uh, you know, monetize this, even as we, you know, it's it, essentially these are giant advertising companies, they kind of commodify, monetize, track, surveil every aspect of our life. They are actually doing good. Uh, or they will say, yeah, it's unfortunate a couple of bad things happened, but you know the net result is that we've done done a great job. And it's this very utilitarian, but also this very brutal kind of cost benefit calculation, which itself is contestable, right? But we know, for instance, that you know uh, at its most extreme, Facebook has admitted it's been complicit in violence in uh, in Sri Lanka. It's been complicit in genocidal violence in uh, Myanmar. Uh, that's what an investigation found. Uh, we know, for instance, what's happened with WhatsApp in India. WhatsApp is used by a, uh, by a, a consortium or a sort of kind of uh, uh, an apparatus of uh, Hindu right groups to spread uh, anti-minority violence. WhatsApp has been complicit in lynchings of Muslims. Uh, so the point to me is that, you know, this and at the, in parallel, at the same time, the Bezoses of the world and the Zuckerbergs of the world continue insisting that they are doing good for humanity at large, that they are taking us along on this path of technological progress. Uh, and, and you know, we, we kind of buy this. We kind of buy this message, right? Uh, now, sort of where does Gandhi come in out here and where does the, where does the Gita come in first? Uh, I think, you know, this age of the entrepreneur, we fetishize certain qualities right? Absolute certitude. Uh, we also fetishize this idea that outcomes can be controlled. Now, there's a very rich irony here because temperamentally, ideologically, a lot of these Silicon Valley entrepreneurs are libertarians. And one of the sort of beloved icons for libertarians is Hayek and Hayek's critique of big government and Hayek's critique of a certain kind of thinking was that you can't control outcomes, right? That's why you you know, that's why socialism failed. You can't fix the price of a tomato. So on the one hand, they claim that, you know, they're libertarians. But on the other hand, there's this complete arrogance about, you know, we want to shape the future of humanity in this manner. I was actually at an event at Google and uh, someone there said that, you know, here's the thing that we use your data because we think it could benefit you because we could find out, you know, some possible medical condition that you're suffering from based on what you're uh, surfing and we could show you an ad for that. And my question is, did I ever ask you to do that, right? So you have this kind of savior complex. Uh, so to me, you know, where the Gita comes in, the gift that I call it the gift of Arjuna's anguish. Why do we live in this world where anguish, where doubt, right, is seen as a sign of weakness? And this kind of intersects with a particular model of, I'd say, toxic masculinity as well. So to me, yes, you know, Krishna's 
uh, you know, Krishna's surety, which is attributed to his sort of divinity, one might say, that's a whole other question. And again, it's not a question I really get into. Uh, of course, there is value in, 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 in what Krishna says. But to me, again, that's my reading. It's Arjuna's doubt, Arjuna's anguish, right? That these are qualities that we see as signs of weakness. But in some sense, I think uh, appreciating these, whether as individuals, as teachers, as people who work in tech firms, Right, whatever you do, in a very practical sense, thinking about the possible consequence, the the possible consequences of what you might do, in the knowledge that you cannot control outcomes, a certain epistemic humility going hand in hand, and linking back to Nishkama Karma Yoga, I think that's what the value is. So that's how I think it could become an ethic for everyday life, uh, which which will you know really serve as a kind of critique. So I think I'll leave it at that. Maybe if that kind of responds to the question, yeah, and then actually, uh, I I was thinking uh, we have one question already, uh, also from a philosophy professor, um, uh, Karabi Sen, um, and you know uh, we'll we'll get to that. Uh, we we have plenty of time, but I wanted to ask you if you at this point would like to read a little bit from the book. Maybe if there's something that you know kind of will help us to focus all these diverse um, kind of strands in our conversation uh, a little bit. Uh, sure. If you'd but, like to, you know, just read a selection uh, for, for a couple of minutes. That would be nice. All right. So I'll, I, there is a passage and it's, you know, it's a personal passage. I want to just sort of talk about how, uh, you know, like, how did I know the Gita? And it's sort of always been with me in a sense, but it's, it's, it's again, uh, you know, and that, that kind of became the point of departure. So I'll just sort of start with that and then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll end in a couple of minutes and then Ananya, you can let me know if if I'm going on and on. Uh, so I, I, I want to talk about, you know, it's the Gita's ubiquity here. And in a sense, it's, you know, it's like, to me, it was like those songs that came on All India Radio. They were always there. And, you know, I'm, I'm almost 50, pushing 50. I realized that things that I heard like, 45, 40 years ago, when I hear those songs on Spotify, I know them, right? Without ever thinking, I actually know every bit of the tune and the words. So I'll just read that passage. Uh, the Gita is ubiquitous in Indian social life. Its insights woven into daily routines, its quotes inscribed on the flapping plastic curtains of auto rickshaws, proclaimed on posters everywhere and emblazoned in the lobbies of corporate houses. In a characteristically incisive observation, the scholar and poet A.K. Ramanujan notes that no Hindu ever reads the Mahabharata for the first time. Indeed, I cannot recall a time when I have not known of the Gita or of the characters of Arjuna and Krishna, just as I cannot tell when exactly sayings from the Gita first entered my consciousness. I remember my father quoting the dictum most closely identified with the book of the virtue of effort without seeking reward a sentiment that seemed directly at odds with practically everything that the culture of middle-class India of the 1980s stood for, given its soul-crushing, unhealthy competitiveness. Whatever has happened is for the good. Whatever is happening is for the good. Whatever will happen will also be for the good. I have a memory of seeing this sentiment from the Gita in roughly similar phrasing, etched in a wooden plaque above a photocopier at a stationery shop in my neighborhood in Bombay. Words that struck me as simultaneously optimistic and fatalistic. A stubborn contradictoriness that I would find later in other arguments in the book too. An essential part of, India's, of Indian identity, of Indian popular culture, and of India's image of itself, the Gita manifests itself in many forms across various media. It showed up at my home in several editions. A Hindi translation published by a local North Delhi press that my grandparents brought with them when they visited us in the different cities in which we lived across India, in a children's book on, in English on Indian religious deities, as a volume of Amar Chitra Katha, the comic book series that was my unofficial introduction to so much about Indian history, religion, culture and mythology, inexpensive audio tapes of recitations from the Gita, along with other devotional offerings, could be found at any music store or stall on the sidewalk in, in markets in Delhi, Calcutta and Bombay, mingling with offerings from popular Western artists and songs from Hindi cinema. At handicraft stores, brass renderings of the most famous tableau from the Gita 
depicting Krishna and Arjuna sitting in a horse-drawn chariot or rath, were as common as models of the Taj Mahal or statues of the Buddha. I remember the reference to the Gita in a song from the film Yud, endlessly playing on tape recorders and radios in public spaces in the 80s, at a time when listening to the songs of Hindi cinema was one of the few modes of entertainment commonly enjoyed by most Indian social classes. The song Yud Kar, literally do battle, or more loosely, go fight, includes the lines, Krishan ne kaha Arjun se, na pyar jata dushman se yudh kar. Translating to Krishna said to Arjuna, don't express love for your enemy, go battle. The lines reduce and misrepresent, in classic Bollywood style, the complexity of Arjuna's anguish and torment at the prospect of having to fight his kinsmen to an unseemly fondness for the enemy. The Gita travelled across private and public thresholds, inhabiting spaces of work and leisure. Outside my school in Calcutta in the 1980s, a host of itinerant vendors would set up shop each day around the time the school day got done. Along with fruit sell the fruit seller, the Jhal Muriwala and the ice candy man, an enterprising mobile salesman would set up a display of posters. While waiting for my school bus, I would marvel at the dazzling arrangement of popular visual art, spread out like a feast for the eyes. There, rubbing shoulders with scenes of the Alps, images of Wham, Madonna and Michael Jackson, red Ferraris and yellow Lamborghinis, cricketers and Bollywood actors were posters with renditions of several scenes from the Gita. Krishna with the Sudarshan Chakra, Krishna and Arjun in his chariot, Krishna bathed in divine light, his face radiating serenity, while a kneeling Arjuna gazed up awestruck at him. The bright colours of the posters, with their impossibly blue skies, radiant golds and reds, and bold ornate text were captivating, drawing on lineages of Indian sacred art, but reflecting popular Indian aesthetic idioms as well. Other gods and goddesses, Kali and Durga, Rama and Vishnu, housed in their own posters, kept Arjuna and Krishna company, as did mortals like the cricketer Kapil Dev, who was worshipped by some 750 million Indians for captaining India to an improbable victory in the 1983 One Day Cricket World Championship. I think I'll stop there and we can get back to the conversation. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, oh gosh, you know, I, I mean, we are almost exact contemporaries and, and I think, I, I mean, I share all these memories even though I wasn't in Calcutta. Uh, I was in Delhi. Uh, in, in those years, but every single thing you said really resonated. Um, but, um, you know, I, 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 I wanted to, uh, well, this, we now have, I, it, you remember Rohit, just yesterday I was telling you that uh, another friend, Manish uh, Firak Bhattacharji has a new book called, uh, you know, uh, uh, looking for, uh, you know, uh, looking, uh, for, looking for the nation towards another idea of India, a fairly recent book. And I was telling you that you, you both should be in conversation, you know, him and you. So he's actually attending and he's typed in a, a comment, uh, which I'll, I'll just share with you. Um, he's, he says he's, he's just going to provide a little quote from his book. Uh, 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 and he says, Gandhi sees Arjuna's reluctance to fight, which is seemingly ethical, arising from a reason of delusion, where Arjuna makes a vain distinction between kinsmen and others. You can see it in the chat box, uh, Rohit, if you, if you open yeah, the yeah. chat box. So Arjuna doesn't satisfy Gandhi because he does not raise the moral question about killing as such. Um, you know, it, 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 he's, 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 he's only worried about killing his own kinsmen, right? Um, for Gandhi, only posing the general or by extension, the universal question of violence, that is the moral necessity. It's not really about my kinsmen or, you know, your kinsmen. Arjuna lacks commitment to the principle of nonviolence as such. Arjuna, however, was at war against his kinsmen. His question is contextually ethical. Right. This is uh, this is uh, from um, Manish's book. So I don't know if you'd like to comment on that. Um, well, it's a super point, and I want to say that it's you know it's it's like the issue of uh, the fact that the phrase Nishkama Karma Yoga doesn't appear anywhere in the Gita. I I came upon that rather late, and I had a minor heart attack. Now this is an excellent point Manish makes. It's something I should have found, but. 
you know, I don't know whether it was Ashish Nandi or someone else who said that one of the problems with Gandhi is he wrote so much. And I think someone said Gandhi actually wrote more than he read. So to me, he was a little bit like Chetan Bhagat in that regard. <laughs> so, sorry, I've been waiting for a long time to say that in some forum. Uh, but I think it's an excellent point. It's an excellent point. It's the kind of thing that I really should have spoken about there. Uh, I'll just respond in two ways, not to, you know, kind of come up with a counter argument because I don't disagree with, with Manish's point at all. I think he's, he's spot on about that. Uh, I'll go to the point about contextuality. I have a bit of a discussion about the question of the necessity of violence or of any kind of action or the rationale for any kind of action is context based, right? So in this, you know, I, I bring in the whole sort of discussion on violence in conversation with just war theory and so on that what is the context in which violence could be based? And again, the related question for me is that who gets to have a say in what contextual factors matter the most? Right. But I think he's absolutely right. Like one of the ways in which I try and read that passage or I try and find value in Arjuna's sentiment is I'm saying it's, it doesn't exist in that world because this is a world where I think Romila Thapar has a lovely essay which relates to the question of how do you locate the Gita in relation to the Mahabharata as, as at large? Is it part of the Mahabharata? Was it a later edition? But it is a society that's in transition from the world of Kul or clan to the world of caste, right? The norms of like caste kingship. Uh, but the fact that Arjuna is, is tormented and having to go at war with his kins very much reflects the prioritization of kin uh, in that sense. So yes, he does not sort of eschew value. My way of trying to read it, right, um, is, is, is to say that how can we extend the idea of who our kin are? How can we extend the idea of who our fellow beings are? It's an unsatisfactory resolution, perhaps. And I, I'll just end by linking this back to, you know, the the wonderful observations that that you and Devasya shared about, uh, you know, the 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 question of the political salience of the Gita, right? The ambivalence. Uh, so to me, you know, even when you think about Gandhi reading it allegorically, right? Kurukshetra is a battle in the soul, a battle between good and evil, the heart of darkness or whatever. Uh, this in an interesting way, uh, you know, I'm a student of literature, as I think Aranya, you are too. Uh, it linked back to a debate in, in aesthetics, uh, literary aesthetics, that when you move to the realm of allegory, when you move, is, is once you move to the formalist register, is that kind of hermeneutic move by definition something that results in deep politicization, right? So is the formalist move, is the hermeneutic move, is the move towards sort of reading something as allegory symbol, does it necessarily and inevitably involve dehistoricization and therefore apoliticization? And as a methodological move, is it apolitical? I know we are moving in a different direction, but you know, I think there's, it's an argument that Terry Eagleton and other Marxists and I think to some extent cultural materialists and others have put forward. But thank you, Manas, for that fabulous, fabulous point. Oh. We had a question from Karabi uh, Sen, which has now disappeared from the Q&A box. It was there for a long time. Um, it was about uh, Jain and Buddhist uh, understandings and, 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 and whether the Gita could be, um, you know, a kind of middle path. Uh, Karabi, if you're still there, um, Mrs. Sen, if you're still there, please, uh, please, could you put your question back in the box so that I can read it out? Um, um, in the meantime, I mean, uh, if, 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 if uh, you know, that's not happening immediately, I just, I, you know, I wanted to, uh, Take you up on this uh, issue of of of, of um, context, uh, context and aesthetics and and politicization and historicization, right? Um, that uh, you know, I, I I told you I found whilst you know trying to prepare for this event, I found this wonderful book uh, of um, miniatures by Alabaksh, uh, a, a painter in one of the Mewari courts. Uh, in the late, uh, at the very end of this uh, of the 17th century, um, in which the whole of the Gita is uh, illustrated, um, and um, 
you know, there's a there's a wonderful sort of commentary on, on each each painting by by Alok Bhalla and by Chandra Prakash Deva um, uh, in this book. And as I was telling you, what is so interesting is that frame after frame after frame after frame in this beautiful miniature style, in this Mewari style is showing you the two characters talking to each other, right? Now, how is this to be, I mean, how do you, how do you represent and dramatize a samvad, a conversation, which is of a deeply reflective character, right? No story is being told, no plot is being, uh, you know, enacted. There's no actual kind of drama unfolding, right? It's in fact a pause in the action of the battle, right? Or, or a for, I mean, I, I mean, and it's just before the, uh, it's just before the uh, the action actually takes place that that uh, you know this this uh, this conversation is 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 happening. And so, so the question to my mind was. How is he even illustrating this, right? This highly abstract conversation in absolute stillness where the two characters are just sitting there on their chariot and talking, right? And he, each picture is still different. And you don't see a battlefield. You don't see blood and bodies. You don't see carnage. You don't see weapons, right? Uh, in fact, you see, um, you know, other kinds of, scenes in different parts of the painting where um, you know maybe two ordinary people are talking uh, or you see Dhritarashtra and Sanjay uh, who are actually the kind of you know the frame uh, where Sanjay is telling Dhritarashtra what what these people are doing you see them sort of also sitting there and Dhritarashtra you remember is blind so again you know this question of framing of representation of enactment of dramatization um, and the the aesthetics of that Right. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, the 17th century Allah Baksh, uh, right. I mean, he's, he, he does it so beautifully, um, uh, you know, whilst retaining literally um, sort of verse after verse after verse after verse of the, of the, of the Gita, uh, you know, and, and all of their meaning, he nevertheless manages to render it pictorially. Uh, in a way that each frame is is distinct, right, and and manages to convey the meanings, you know, minus any kind of um, set or scene, which changes, right, minus any kind of action or plot, right, which which is which is evolving um, uh, in this in this kind of weird graphic novel <laughs> of the Gita. Um, so I think that um, you know it's it's a it's a uh, it's 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 part of the it's part of the richness of the text and it's it's also what allowed somebody like you to enter into this text, you know where where you you can you can talk about nine eleven and you can talk about the Babri Masjid and you can talk about you know the pandemic and it's all still uh, you know the, the 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 text is affording you that space of a conversation. Right, in which the text itself is unfolding, um, the conversation, the samvad between uh, between um, uh, Krishna, uh, Krishna and Arjuna. So I think I'm seeing now. Karubi's question is back in the Q and A box. Um, uh, Professor Sen, uh, she's asking, is nishkama karma a matter of degrees? Um, now. Um, then there's somebody else, it says anonymous attendee, uh, who's saying, um, we tend to relate to everything by thinking that, you know, when I do this, then the result will be this, right? I have done this job in order to help people. I've done this job because I want to help my family, etc. There's a constant interconnectedness between these two thoughts, right? I mean, cause and effect, I guess. Uh, how do you break that connection? Would you like to elaborate more on this? And and so the first question was: Is nishkama karma a matter of degree? Um, it's a really good question, and I think Professor Sen right uh, also asked if this is something that came from the Jain and Buddhist traditions. So 
you know, as far as locating the ideas of the Gita in in uh, in terms of their philosophical lineage, she, she didn't ask if it came from them, but she said, you know, is it kind of a middle path between path. how okay. the Jains approach this and how the Buddhists approach okay. this? I think so I was going to say that you know they. The philosophical conversation about you know relating it to other schools of thought that's about my pay grade really but i think it's a very good question I, I i could say so because what i've tried to do and i think this goes to the second point as well is that i make a conceptual distinction between outcomes and consequences right the outcome is the final end product and i consider consequences to be what may be different you can think of them as like different possible paths or probabilities or all the different things that might have that might happen and one of the ways in which i try to read that passage which contains the 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 idea as devasya put it so well embryonically of nishkama karma yoga is that you know that you cannot control outcomes and you mustn't want to but perhaps you, that doesn't mean there is a cause for inaction so i use that as a springboard to say that we then need to think about all the different possible consequences. Now, can consequences be a synonym for outcomes? That's something I grappled with. Am I saying exactly the same thing, right? Is it, uh, you know, so is this in some ways a kind of, uh, uh, you know, an illusory kind of distinction? I would like to think not, but I completely see the point about, uh, you know, uh, a question of degree, right? Which is, uh, you know, how do you separate the two all the time? It's not easy, easy because we are so for all kinds of reasons, like whether out of psychological motivation or whether the nature of the world that we inhabit or, you know, social structures, we are so attuned and geared towards thinking about, you know, what outcomes will be. So on a day to day basis, it's hard to sort of uh, it's hard, I think, to kind of, I would say, leech one's thinking completely of that. But I think for me, the, the, the way to sort of understand it is that if you, if you think you can control outcomes, or if you think by doing X, Y, Z, you will necessarily lead to this outcome, or you can better shape this outcome. Um, I think that, you know, that a, that there is a kind of, that's a kind of dead end, right? And, you know, it's, it's a source of frustration. It's a source of anxiety. It leads you away from a condition of equanimity, which is the, the sort of the, you know, the highest state of being that someone should aspire to according to Krishna. So that would be, uh, you know, my, my, my kind of response to, I'd say both, both those issues. Uh, and in a way, this kind of links back to the point that, uh, that you made about that depiction in that beautiful edition, the, the Deval and Bhalla edition, and I have that too, that it seems like a paradox, right? That war is raging all around, and here is this absolute moment of stillness and, and conversation. Now, very interestingly, in, in, in a sort of, you know, in an ancient modality of battle, so to say, or the norms of pre-modern, pre-industrial battle, this is an interesting kind of trope. Even if you watch Game of Thrones, you have the armies lined up on both sides, you know, sometimes there's an attempt for negotiation or a peace flag, and you will often find that there are last minute dis discussions happening in real quiet before the battle breaks out. I kind of, again, coming back in a sense to the aestheticization, I read that as a kind of aesthetic interpretation of the fact, or as a kind of, in an allegorical reading, uh, a representation of the fact that, you know, we, we can think of we can think of life as struggle, as uh, Edward Said put it, life is agon, right? It's constant struggle. So you think of life as battlefield, right? You think about for so many people, for all of us in different ways, uh, you know, it is life is a constant battle against routine challenges, routine humiliations. So if you think of life as agon, if you have that vision, in that sea of agon, the way to go ahead is to have that quiet reflectiveness, right? or to find some space for reflecting on consequences and to find some space for dialogue, whether it is with another or whether it is with oneself. Yeah. I think um, uh, and Devasya may like to come in on this. Devasya, yeah. uh, uh, that, uh, you know, um, the term, well, why does Nishkama Karma not actually occur in the Gita? I mean, this is an odd question to ask, like why is something not in a text? But then it's there in all the commentary literature and it's, you yeah. know, it, it comes to represent the, because, because you can't really have action without eros, right? 
without desire, without karma, you know, driving you from inaction into action, right? Uh, now, the question is that we are trying to cultivate non-attachment to the phala, to the outcome, like the fruit of, of, of the karma, right? To the karma phala, we are, that, that's what we are trying to cultivate detachment towards, right? But it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to claim that, you know, we, our actions are completely without any kind of motivating force, right? Driving them, which is karma. Right, um, there's something that we want to know, or that we want to achieve, or that we want to gain, or that we want to capture. Uh, you know, or that we want to fulfill. Um, that 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 surely is uh, is 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 behind this um, ceaseless kind of churn uh, of, of of human life. But um, I I mean I'm not. Hang on, just let me see if there's more questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a there's a question by Pratap Beheda who's saying Loka Sangraha is a concept in the Gita. Now I don't I I mean I don't I don't know that's I don't think that's there in your book. But Devasya, maybe if uh, yeah, yeah. you know you want to take that, please do. Yeah. So I would I would just go back to a couple of points uh, which. Rohit made and you made because I can. Sorry, kind of just just before you begin, I just want to say that that you know we've reached the end of the time that we technically announced, but we are absolutely free to carry on our conversation, and nobody seems to have left. So uh, <laughs> please continue. Please continue, and we we you know it's fine if people have more I, questions I, I, or comments. Yeah. So I just want to you know recollect the point which uh, uh, Rohit made. He says that uh, he was saying about uh, the uncertainty faced by Arjuna. Arjuna Vishada Yoga means that. And uh, for Gandhi, as Ananya was pointing out, the problem was that Arjuna was not discussing Hinsa per se, but the Sojana. I mean, he says he's going to kill his own, his own Kitanke. That's the problem. So he's making a distinction between Sojana and Parayajan. That is the problem. Okay. I, since uh, you end up, you, you, you end your book and also begin with that by, by looking at the way how Gandhi read. This is one of the things which I find in Gandhi. He always took to an action only when he had heard that feeble voice within himself, which he calls sometimes conscience or that light, which he says it is, it is available to every human person. He says that. And that is what made him, I believe, stand alone. Look at the Napoli experience, you know. He stands alone. Everybody leaves him, you know. So I think that is what. So this uncertainty is one is of the type of Arjuna, Arjunayin. Other one is when one fails to hear that inner voice, the feeble voice. And that is the Gandhi. Look at the Dandi marks. The man determined because he has heard the voice. And he goes. So this is something I find in, find in Gandhi. And Javed says, Andy says, oh my, I don't know. My own, I don't see that. I don't hear that voice again. He's in dilemma. He says that. I don't hear that voice again. And this he says, he claims it is available to every human uh, person. Every, every human person. The second thing. Uh, I think if you look at the Gita, it's philosophical background. You know, if you, if you read the writings of that, the author of the, of the Gita, the Vyasa, in a sense, the mythological Rishi, there's a tension there. Why? I think by the time the second century BC, you have a philosophical problem, a debate in the Indian tradition between the, the Brahmanic tradition, which was forcing, uh, which was focusing on karma, and the Sramanic tradition, which was focusing on asceticism. asceticism. So you have pravritti versus Nivritti. Yeah. Pravritti is action oriented, you know, and Nivritti is, you know, you withdraw from that. Now, the problem is this both these are problematic for the order of the Gita. Why? If you perform Pravritti, you will have to bear consequences, karma for that. You will be reborn thousand times. You don't know. There's no moksha available. You are again postponing your, uh, your moksha. That's a problem. But Nivritti means the world won't be there. 
if i stop doing all our actions you know what happens if we stop the world will cease to be world so this is the problem and it is there this karma karma comes in now this karma karma is a problem concept and i agree that is not uh, you know in the in the gita the word per se but the idea is very much in that verse karmanne vadigaraste mahaleshu kadachana that is often everybody says that and i find that you know here we also have the shuddhi smriti dialectic people don't remember upanishads much but i think you you have this the gita i mean the people may not keep mahabharata in their homes because of the idea that you'll become a warfare but they keep gita in their homes in the hindu books i'm told that so this is the problem. this is it second what is this samvada i think this samvada also has a upanishadic background the upanishad you have the image of two birds on the sitting on the same tree one see one bird is a witness sakshin consciousness the other bird is enjoying eating the fruits in fact this is metaphorized into krishna and arjuna krishna is nothing but the higher self of yours and arjuna is the lower self which is you know your kama raga dvesha moha everything but you are world is that prapancha the world is that so this is really an interesting interesting so i would say this dialogue sambhat happens within of course for ordinary people they need to have somebody outside you know that is there but i think this sambhat happens within within myself that i agree with that thing rohit and and in your verse no body sambhat is really intrinsic to our life it happens within that now uh 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 loka sangraha loka sangraha in fact towards end of the gita in the 18 uh, 18th chapter before that it says one who is yoga root na yoga in a, in, a, in, a, in the gita is a very different concept one aspect the yoga you know the yoga karma se kausalam yoga okay a yeah, skillful action one who is skillful in action now these all are very very pregnant words i mean these are very different i mean that's why it, it is it is between activism and uh, you know monasticism it's actually a call to be a contemplative in action not in action in action contemplative in action this is what the gita is saying yeah the gita is saying now loka sangraha means welfare of all loka sangraha welfare of all and this is what the gita says as the ideal of a person who has who is on the way to self realization loka sangraha and that of course uh, then of course it, it discusses what is yoga karma se kausalam yoga okay and i i love the word uh, yoga root then they say samachitta bhava where you fail or very not you at the end of course you will be troubled to some extent but you are basically equanimous there is equanimity in you equanimity in you and this is very important today i think thanks to social media facebook or likes you know people get really disturbed when somebody dislikes somebody all right now gita says no this will happen now this will happen so this is i think this is what so therefore it has a context why this dialogue is placed you know just before the war is about to begin in fact the war is the text as well as the context i should say that the war i mean you could say about that internally or externally so loka sangraha i agree with the comment that is the 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 the, the, the imagined ideal of a person who has acquired the the, the affinity of this karma karma after the after the gita idea the gita idea loka sangraha this is what this one I, i agree with that now why did the why uh, i mean the word doesn't happen i think that as you already said in your you know answer ananya that i think i've said also about that earlier it is after actually uh, gandhi ji's comment imagine he didn't discuss commentary with other people he himself gave discourse on the gita in gujarati first you know this is this and he is a in fact some people say he is is a baniya how can he give a discourse on the gita he is not a brahmin right there serves a caste subversion here right i was told that in a gujarat vidyapeeth where he founded 
there was a room in the central part of the university uh, where he used to go and do mauna but unfortunately that is kept always locked <laughs> mauna is kept locked so this man is different he is a metaphor so my question is this uh, uh, you know the gita ideal of this kama karma it's a possibility it's a possibility towards perfection of the self it is not i i don't say it is it is not against karma no it only says that you know you have a right to the duties what is supposed to do i can't control the phala and that is possible only when you become as far i see the, the, the gita when you have seen the lord when you have become truly spiritual you know that you know that this is this is this is my way of reading the idea of loga sangra and this kama karma that's it thanks uh, devasya so i think um, you know let's let's wrap up in 3 4 minutes uh, rohit i'm going to let you have the last word uh, i think we've addressed all the questions in some form or other uh, and we still have almost all our participants but uh, probably uh, in 3 4 minutes we should wrap up so if there's any last words you want to say rohit you want to leave us with any thoughts uh you want to suggest uh you know more more readings uh anything anything that that you know you want to say please do do so now just a word before rogin is saying his last word just a word yeah 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 i was very happy in fact uh, ecstasy of joy when i saw in the via that we have the use the book by rohit as well as manish both have the pendings by mm kusey you know both have the paintings by mm hussein and eda eda dharmasya it is written there and krishna and arjuna and the uh, samba so that was a i don't know a divine choreography i think i think so but i just wanted to put it <laughs> no in. it's true that hussein has uh, and in fact we were looking at those paintings uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. rohit uh, when we were trying to design the invitation for this event that yeah, yeah. hussein has uh, has illustrated uh, you know this this kind of iconic dialogue yeah. uh, between uh, between krishna and arjuna yeah. but uh, yeah please uh, you know uh, uh, rohit well, over to you yeah oh first i want to like thank you ananya thank you devasya everyone at csds ayodhya praveen again thanks to shweta and ajita uh, at west and everyone else at westland and thanks to everyone who took the time out for a uh, you know, it's very gratifying as an academic uh to have you know people actually spend their valuable time listening to one discuss these arcane issues so called arcane issues which one thinks are of interest to one only so i'm actually going to i'd like to just end by you know responding to something that i saw a number of questions around this some points that you you've raised and we we know the sort of tragedy that mf hussain faced towards the end of his life right because of hindu nationalists having to relocate to dubai and so on and i So an interesting fact I actually when I lived in Bombay I used to live in the building across from MF Hussain uh I would see him at the bus stop that I would take to go to school he would be there in a denim jacket barefoot uh and he was a very whimsical man and my do- the doctor I went to actually lived next door to him and in that same floor I think it was this 8th floor or 10th floor and in, in I think it was Jolly Maker 3 was the name of the building there was a children's cycle there's some kid who had his bike So one day apparently Hussein comes out and he's in a whimsical mood and he just puts a couple of strokes of paint on the cycle and the mom knows this is a Hussein painting now so she takes the cycle in and the poor child can never cycle again but that is just a, it's just an anecdote so i want to end with this whole question of you know both the welfare of the other as well as you know the question of here is the text that has its you know questions of its aspects of hierarchy uh you know a privileges family privileges patriarchy and so much but can we you know what can we get out of it i mean we can take our pre- understanding of difference of equality of rights and so on to kind of critique the text but how can we still maybe find the text as a voice that speaks to us in light of questions of difference respecting difference equality and and this is where i think i will take devasya's critique and say that you know some something i could have written about more but as i i i got through the book and i thought about it uh you know one of the terms that is is very prevalent in western society in america right now it's very faddish is this idea of the care of the self right which is that uh you know you have to look after yourself and sure that makes sense 
But increasingly, as I think about it, the care of the self is not possible without recognizing the divinity of the other, right? And to me, I think that may be one of the directions in which in which the Gita gestures. And I think that could be the kind of understanding that either gives, you know, the secular frame its content or overcomes the bridge or, as Devasya pointed out, sacralizes the secular. Thinking back to the, the, the way in which you, you juxtaposed Gandhi and Ambedkar, uh, you know, I, I again thought of a line that my, my teacher Abdullah Yannayim came up with about human rights, which is, you can see the discourse of rights is coming from that enlightenment tradition. And he says that if we have to give rights legitimacy, rights are both absolutely necessary and they're absolutely inadequate, right? Their concept, they're so necessary, but not sufficient. So where do we get that content? Or where do we get that kind of, you know, respect for others as a legal and social principle? Where do we give it substance? And I think one of the ways in which we can go about that is to really respect the divinity of the others, such as such that we we rethink the notion of self versus versus others. And to me, this opens out, you know, this this becomes a much wider conversation because it then links the Gita to, you know, whether it's Ashish Nandi's idea of convivencia, right? In terms of Ashish Nandi's critique of secularism or Martin Buber's notion of I, thou. Uh, and I think that really, you know, again, and then finally, just really thinking about the consequences of to the extent that it, whether it is a, whether it is a regulative ideal, right? That we can never actually sort of uh, attain whether it's just a principle that can help us sort of guide everyday action even if if it's a perfect ideal we can never attain i mean when we th we really do need to think about that you know whether it is with regard to climate change whether it's regard to you know coexisting with with different with not just you know difference in the realm of the human but also between you know us and the natural world at large and i think in hind swaraj that is another one of gandhi's messages right that man's or humans ident the identity of humans is is also ecologically bound right that there's a particular ecological relationship and i think that's one of his worries about technology that it disrupts that ecological relationship and as you know you know any interaction in social media degenerates into violence or symbolic violence or abuse so quickly chances are if you had exactly that same conversation face to face just with recognizing the humanity of the other or with the nuance it might not go that way. So on that scattered note, I'll just end, uh, you know, from, I'll just conclude from my end with thanks again. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Rohit. Um, thank you, Devasya. It's lovely as usual to see you. And uh, I hope the day comes soon when you can, both of you can visit, actually visit the center um, you know, and we can we can continue our dialogue about so many things. Um, as you know, many people uh, at the center are, you know, very very interested in issues around um, social media, around new media, around you know technology and and, and society, and um, and many people are interested in 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 philosophical and uh, you know. Uh, uh, religious issues and and questions, especially around secularism, which is uh, which is a favorite uh, subject uh, uh, in Rajpur Road. So um, thank you, uh, Rohit. I'm I'm glad that uh, you know we were able to we were able to find a time uh, <laughs> um, in this pandemic time. And um, thank you, Devasya, for your for your wonderful as ever. Uh, um, interventions and, 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 and comments. And uh, yeah, uh, I think if, if anybody would like, uh, you know, to continue talking to the author or to our panelists, uh, you know, you can find all of us uh, through our various institutions and send an email or, um, you know, just, just, just write to me uh, and I will pass on um, your, your queries, comments, etc. So thank you all very, very much and uh, good night and have a nice day, Rohit. Thanks very much. Bye, Thanks. bye, bye, bye.